Good day, good evening. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Emmanuel from Vioso, and I'd like to say hello and welcome to the screencast, to the webinar. On behalf of Langiberia and Vioso, you will see me mainly talking about how to make use of Vioso technology. I will show you that based on a panoramic projection, so a setup as simple as it can be, and you will be surprised how much you can already see and learn from such a simple setup. The other setup, the second part, will be a dome projection. I will use our dome, you see it in the back, with incredible 12 projectors, and we will uh, scan and map this dome within this hour, in, in fact, much, much less than this hour, and run the results in the Pixera Media Server, something that you might have uh, already, or if not, you can definitely supply that from Lang Iberia. So, let's begin. Um, you see me sending from a studio where I'm sitting in back of the dome, but as I said, I am going to start with a panoramic projection. So let's visit our showroom. And what you see here is in fact um, a camera feed where you see two projectors on a flat screen. So that's the most easy step setup you can think of as projectors. And this is how we are going to start. Um, if you never have used a Vioso technology, here's a brief introduction. All the core of what Vioso is doing is automated camera-based projector alignment. So all kinds of soft edge projection, all kinds of mapping, this is the domain of Vioso. And the products that we provide are then differing in the target. So let's say if it's a simple backdrop with video with easy players, if you're running the big shows, then there are media servers like Pixera, Cool Look, Seven Cents, you name it. So our technology goes into that media servers and make a big project happen. And sometimes you have something like a third-party application, whiteboard, video, streaming, um, a Unity game, whatever. Then another branch of our products is targeting to this kind of um, projection. But the core is always the same. using a camera or several cameras to make large seamless projected image. So we are starting this panorama with Vioso Player. That's in fact the most easiest and most easy to access tool set. Maybe I will show you later how to acquire it. Um, but right now, what you see here is again the setup. And, um, and here's going to the, the Vioso Player. Just one remark, um, we are streaming in 1080p, full HD. Probably you will have issues not seeing all details of the software I'm going to show if you have a scaled downstream. So please make sure if you are can do to maximize the stream, to receive full HD. Sometimes the, the, um, the YouTube player also needs some tweaking and the settings. So make sure that you have really the full HD impression because probably the details matter. At least we're talking about pixel precise alignment. So details do matter in our business. So again, saying that, let's go real. Um, so I hope you can follow me. That's a camera that's now looking into our showroom with two projectors, obviously not calibrated. We are going to use that very camera to calibrate it. And it is a, a very simple camera, actually. So what we're going to use is a webcam like this, a uh, quite standard webcam. It's a Logitech C930, which serves us very well and is a quasi de facto standard in webcams that we find everywhere. Um, um, to continue, and since we are using the camera, I'm now going to deactivate the camera stream. You will see what's happening inside our software. So camera goes off, Viso player goes on. So actually, if it's a Vioso player, or if it's the calibration integrated, it's always the same workflow. We start to calibrate our system by getting yeah, the calibration to start it. And here we see our displays. So in this case, we see one projector that is um, combined with a mosaic setting. Just to give you a little excuse in that, what does that mean? It's that two projectors are combined onto one seamless desktop. 
It's a topic that we could now spend a lot of time on, but we have a good resource to explain what this is in our help desk, se help desk section. Oh, hard to say. I will point to it later. So simply consider that our calibration technology is made for any kind of setting, may it be display expander, span displays, um, combined displays, if multiple um, computers per projector are supported. So I'm going to split that so that we have, in fact, two projectors. And we are going to make a flat screen calibration. We see the cameras. There's just one camera available. It's very easy to select and we can give it a name. Let's say screencast session. It's just for the sake of making it good looking. The calibration is an assistant. So it goes step by step through each, um, through each required interaction. And in the end, you get a result. So in fact, the configuration happens on the fly. Next step is that we say it's at a um, horizontal strip, a grid. In this case, easy, it's a horizontal strip. That information helps us to improve the blend. We are going to make a new scan. So this helps me to skip some settings if that would be a rescanning. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I did something wrong. So let's go back. I chose the wrong display to calibrate. So again, uh, yes, I made it wrong. So forgive me that. We're going to start a new calibrate. And now let's change the split to the projectors, Vivitega projectors. Yes. Okay. So now this is what happens. We have the camera view. It's similar to what you have seen before because it's still the same camera. When we talk about cameras, about calibration, what need these cameras to have, uh, what requirements are, are based on these cameras? The most important thing is that you can control all aspects of the camera, at least that you can deactivate any automatic setting of this camera. So right now we see a camera image that is a bit too bright. Um, and depending on the camera that you're using, these uh, options and these format settings are different. This is now a typical webcam setup. So. Clicking on format gives us information about what color space, the frame rate, so how the image stream is delivered. In this case, we want to have a full HD stream. There's nothing to do. The options are how the stream looks like. So if that is too bright, I want to change it. So using the camera settings, even the automatic ones, is a very nice thing to do as long as you are able to deactivate it. So the most important lesson to start is use your camera, but make sure they don't do anything automatic. So if you see anything that is auto, deactivate it. Now the camera image looks much nicer. So what does nice mean? We are not talking about making it good looking for a video conference or making good looking for um, a video chat or, or something. No, it must go look good for the computer. And it does look good if we see a white and black checkerboard with the highest dynamic so that the black is as black as possible and the white as white as possible. Usually cameras do that with the exposure over the iris. Long story short, if the checkerboard looks like this, it's pretty much okay. It's all we need. Of course, it's situation specific, but if you memorize a clearly not too bright, not too overexposed uh, checkerboard, then you are done. But we are not done getting the step. So this is first of all the camera. The next thing is that a computer vision system always is easily to be tricked. So we can help the scan procedure by defining a so-called region of interest. So to say, well, there's a lot in the camera that we don't require for the scanning. Here you see a lot of tools that do that. In fact, the only thing we need to do is to paint with this painting tool a line around what is interested to scan. So it's a line. And now we can use the paint bucket and apply that as a so-called mask. So everything that is now masked is ignored by the camera and everything else is analyzed. Here it is nice to have, but there are a lot of situations where it is mandatory 
So imagine in a situation where there's a stage with a lot of reflection, where there is a lighting coming from the backdrop or lighting from, from hanging. So um, everything that is artificial light is, is, is um, specifically dangerous for scanning. And later in the dome, you will see that it's important as well, because the camera will capture other projectors. So memorize that. If you can put some shape around the projection and lock it in, it will stabilize the scanning procedure. So the next step is already the first scan. So right now we acquire the information from a first projector. And what we see, first of all, is a white image. So the software starts already to analyze what is the perfect white brightness for a projector, not to over, um, not to overshoot the camera. So this is something we can change in real time. So if you change something, the camera, the projector brightness changes in the camera, but if in doubt, keep it automatic. In most cases, the automatic settings is exactly what we want to have. Let's go to next. We perform a new scan because we have, haven't done something before. And now this is a preview how testing patterns look like. What you cannot see right now is uh, the projection itself. Um, that's simply because I have just this one camera over there. So um, the projectors have now displayed white dots and the camera has filmed these white dots. So what we want to have is as many dots as possible and all green. That's a rule of thumb. All green means, um, well, if there are some dots not green, then probably there's a reason for it. So here, if you remember, we have a black frame around the screen. So anything that is projected on this black frame is hardly to analyze. But on the other hand, we don't want to project on this black frame. So it's not of interest anyhow. So it is OK if we see red dots where red dots are to be expected. Um, memorize this kind of an image. If it looks like that, everything is fine and you won't have any surprise in scanning. Let's begin the scan. And now you can see what's happening actually. So this is a live, sorry, this is a live feed from the camera. You can see the projector is now projecting a line pattern. First, a thick line from the left to the right, from the front, from the top, followed by thin lines and by dots. In this procedure, a lot happens. The system learns, first of all, how each projector is aligned. If it's upside down, mirrored, it doesn't matter, it's going to be scanned. And then, of course, how the projector is mapped to the surface. So as you can see, it took about, mm, I think, less than 20 seconds to scan. Now it, there's uh, going to be a calculation, so you can see calculate geometry. And what we now get is a, after this white pattern, is a first feedback. So this is now the result of the scan. This result is simply there to give the operator a feedback that something happened. So in a critical situation, for example, you could see scanning errors, um, failures, how lines are displayed and can make a, um, changes in the way of it of the scan. Later in the second part of the show, I'm going to, um, to try to make it bad on the dome, just to give an idea how things can go wrong and how to, um, how to uh, compensate that. Here, it is exactly the way it should look like. Everything is already pretty straight. So let's continue with the second projector. So the game repeats, you scan. Looks even a bit better. Now the scan happens. And the funny thing is, um, as you can imagine, I am not there. So I'm going to do the setup without being there, which is usually impossible if you uh, do a projector setup. So imagine what that means. Automatic recalibration, automatic maintaining of setups like in museums required or in a professional simulation. This is exactly what this technology is made for. So nearly done on a second. So let's wait about the calculation. After that, a short white pattern is projected, and this is basically for getting all the color information of the projector. So color degradation, um, the overall brightness, everything, this is um, taken into account to ensure a perfect blend. So that's the right side. And now let's get to the overlap. The overlap is calculated automatically, and this is the final result. 
So all you need to do right now is to make this final result fit to the screen. So this is the total camera image and that's what we call warping or mapping. In fact, it's mapping or warping means to make an alignment of the content to the surface. And if you work on a camera system, actually in the most easiest way, it's made from the camera view. So from the camera view, the content is mapped to the surface. So whether the surface is curved or flat or, or skewed, here is the technology or here are the tools to make the content fit to it. So as you can see, a flat screen requires four points and don't mix that with projector warp. We are not warping a single projector right now. We are warping two projector images that are already blended. So from this moment, after the scan, there is not two projectors or three or four or five. It's one image that changes completely how you deal projection. Well, I'm wondering if that is all clear to you. So feel free again to use the chat and put some questions into it. Um, then um, otherwise I need to assume that um, either you're asleep or you're having a beer or everything is so clear that it's um, obvious. I hope the latter is the truth. Well, of course, have your beer. So after that step, after we have done the warp and blend, VMWall is finished because you can see the blend is done automatically and the alignment of the projectors is done automatically. And the only thing an operator needs to do is to map the content to the screen. So let's say the result, we can save that. Let's call it whatever. So whenever we need to read, visit this calibration or redo it, we simply can um, use um, a saved file. So to show what happens, I'm going to open the camera viewer again. So that's now the look without the calibration. And since um, we are using a player, you see here, a new display has, a, has arrived. So we had the displays Vivitech, Vivitech, and the one that is a monitor, plus now a so-called display compound. In fact, that's the calibration. We can address it, click activate, now the player is going to start to display content. So that's it. That's the result of our calibration that we did right now. And to show it that it's a two projector output, let's put in the stacking mode, so deactivate the blend. So this is with the blend, but still aligned, and without the blend. And to see that it's really interactive, so this is my warping, and you can see I can still, while the video is playing, exercise on the warping and make it even nicer. So by the way, the player comes with a playlist so um, to play back different videos or still images or doing in some cues, that's a piece of cake. Um, so as you can see, the blending is simply done without any interaction, but still um, there are ways to work on the blend. So once this is done, you see here some buttons, color and blending, adjust projectors and mapping. So obviously in the color and blending, you can edit the blend. So right now you see this is the blending that was actually calculated by the camera system. And if it's not working properly, which we don't assume, but here you can fine tune it. Now it's a bit hard to judge that just to a camera stream. So um, rest assured, whenever you have um, that you have um, all operational um, fine tuning options that you are used from other blending systems. That includes also a spline based blending where you have this typical blending curves um, where you edit the blend in a visual and more predictive way. But again, you will see that the blending that is done automatically usually super wise. So it's, it's much better than any manual blend that you're trying to do. So there are other features like treating the whole um, treating the whole um, projection and color and everything. We have a contrast brightness adjustment in addition to what um, projectors do. Is a black level adjustment possible, which of course is limited to black level uplift. And so the most main features from a projectionist are um, provided here. Single projectors can be adjusted as well. So here we see something quite interesting. There's one projector that seems to be a bit lower than the other projector. So can you see that? 
here the value is red, green, blue. They are highest and this is the lowest, which means one projector is brighter than the other one. The software recognizes that and levels the projectors already. And even the color balance of projectors can be changed. So that means let the camera do the first initial um, the first initial evaluation, how projectors should be leveled, and the operator does just the final rest. An operator's eye is the, the standard. An operator's eye is much more sensitive than a camera, but um, with that um, predictive pre-calculation of brightness and levels, a lot of the job is done and facilitated. So a word to the planning and content. There's also some very interesting information. Um, usually, um, you need to work on a specific resolution. So how do you know what resolution do we have right now? Because we haven't done such calculation like how much is the overlap in percentage and stuff. So after a calibration, we have uh, quite sophisticated information what has been done. So what you see here is an analysis of the calibration. We have the left and the right side, and you can see the visualization of the overlap. It's pretty big in this example. That means um, if we take into account the measured overlap and the effect of the warp, what is the final result of effective pixels? It's a question not so easy to answer. But the user technology can instantly answer this question by because it has been a pixel precise, precise um, um, calculation. So we call that the approximate effective content resolution, the resolution that you effectively see on the uh, on the screen out there. And this is uh, calculated to be 2,058 by 1116, which is a content aspect ratio of 2.24. Well, that's interesting information that can be used, uh, for example, to run um, um, real-time rendering systems or to optimize the content. And another question is how, how to make the mapping right so that a square is a square and a circle is a circle. Of course, we have built-in testing patterns, but I want to point out that our service also contains a free test pattern generator that works perfectly together with this information. So once you know what the effective resolution is, why not use a, that to make a test pattern gener to make a test pattern on it? So testpatterngenerator.com is something um, we can get online, a generator for all kinds of testing pattern. So to make sure that we have really that um, that kind of mapping, I would say a test pattern of uh, name screen screen cast the size is as we said 2508 by 1116 sorry 1116 it's just this one display and voila we get a testing pattern that has circles a equal grid which makes um, squares that are easy to measure and has minus plus in all dimensions so that you can orientate. So save that as an image and loading that into the, into the player gives us an instant feedback. Uh, I think it's in downloads, Just downloads, downloads, yes, screencast. So, Actually, that's the testing pattern, and this helps us to verify um, grid is a, the grid stays perfect in alignment. Well, you can already see um, on the green outline that we probably want to touch the warping a little bit. So, even without being here, there you can see how easy it is to align this based on a good testing pattern. So, having a proper testing pattern that fits the aspect ratio of your screen using the online testing pattern generator on www.testpatterngenerator.com. It's a catchy email, a catchy URL, you are done. And so by the way, what I'm doing right now is to add a little bit of warping points because the camera or the screen has a little bit of a distortion. Don't mind. So now with the help of the screencast testing pattern, it looks much better, much more aligned though this kind of content is a bit agnostic of that. So what we've done right now, uh, nearly half an hour is already over, so I need to hurry a little bit.
Um, but you could see on a simple setup like two projectors with a webcam, we can touch already nearly every aspect of a multi projection, which is more or less the same if you would use 10 projector or 20 or whatnot. We have done the calibration, the overlap, the blending itself. We have done the mapping, the test pattern generated and had an analysis about the effective resolution and information that is very hardly to get otherwise. And just to give you an idea what's happening right now. Um, so actually this is what the player outputs right now. So you can see that's the kind of the blend that was calculated. You can already see a bit the warp so that it's um, a bit askew. And well, consider doing that by hand. That's a quite um, quite a job already. Doesn't mean that by hand, doing it by hand is bad at all. Um, if you are used to that, it's absolutely fine. It's uh, another option to do it. And of course, mostly this is done not just for flat screens, but the real usage of a camera-based solution is complex surfaces. So far, um, don't know if there are any questions. So again, let uh, please feel free to drop any questions in the chat. If there's something that you would like uh, to have explained or if something that is doubtful, please use the chat. Um, we are monitoring it and we are happy to answer. Okay, so the next step is to go to the dome. Um, so if you have looked at me here in the back, this is our studio dome. It is really, really a nice thing. It uh, comes uh, with two, di two uh, meters diameter. So it's uh, more or less me fitting in. So hello from the dome. Hello. Um, these are little boxes over here. These are little LED projectors. We have 12 projectors to light up this dome which makes it very bright and very small in the same in a, uh, same time. What you also can see is this. That's a Vioso calibration kit. A Vioso calibration kit is a pre-assembled solution from a professional computer vision camera sensor and a lens. So just to give you an idea um, how that looks like. So these kind of cameras. These are, may not be so known to you. For the calibration, in fact, you can use a lot of cameras. Um, TV cameras can be used, any kind of USB cameras. But to make most use of it, a camera that is made for computer vision is much more advised. So in nearly all cases where we have complex productions, we all, already also supply this camera. So these kind of cameras are, first of all, small. They are run via Ethernet, so they consist of a well, but hard to see. They consist of a of an Ethernet port. So all you need to have is a one Ethernet cabling, and you are good to go with 30, 50 meters of distance without any um, signal issues. Again, this is a camera known more for computer surveillance, um, CCTV, so um, surveillance and in factory automation. And we have a lot of experience to shape these cameras, to calculate cameras, knowing which lens to use, which body to use, because it's a, it's a, a science on its own. Um, it's very likely that companies like Lang Iberia and other partners have calibration kits on stock. So, for example, a full dome calibration kit is something that you probably don't need every day. So you can e easily borrow it, use it for a job and return. Um, other kits are um, wide angle kits like this one. So this is, a, as you can see, it's a different lens. This one, a very wide angle for panoramic setups or there are lenses that are easily to adjust with several rings. But as I said, like a photographer, lens and camera is a bit of a science. And it's more than 12, 30, how old are we? I think even 15 years of experience which cameras work that you can get from us. When there are projects planned, um, don't hesitate to involve us. Let us do this tricky job um, and you concentrate mainly on what you know. So um, I see already a question which is very great. So um, Sogat, um, as you have seen, the overlap, he's, um, um, Sogat Mayumda is um, asking about the overlap. This is something that we will see in the dome as well. Generally, the overlap that we are working with is not depending on us. So the more overlap you have, the more pixels you can use to make it looking seamless. So whatever you know from 
from the projection right now, 10% minimum, 20 better, still applies. Theoretically, um, theoretically, even a one pixel overlap will work, but it's it's of course obvious and visible. So in this dome, we will have overlaps that are about 10%. I will point that out, and we are overlaps that are bigger. So have a look for it. And yeah, if that is, uh, I know that's a lot of information. So what we also do. It's not just making a, a screencast like this, but we also do webinars. So if that is um, required, let's say a webinar specialized to dome projection or webinar to panoramic or multicam, yes, we do that. What we do now is um, have a look at this screen again. It's now blue. So we are now on a different server. Actually, we are on a server um, that is connected to 12 projectors. I know that this is a bit gross. It's honestly not what I would <laughs> suppose to use every day, but it's just nice for us to show um, how how easy you can make a dome projection. So in fact, um, we are making heavy use of NVIDIA technology to combine four graphics cards in this way, four GPUs to have 12, um, 12 projectors attached. I would say don't try this at home because it can be quite tricky and I'm pretty sure that there's no 12 head server available that easy also at Lang. On the other hand, as soon as you're working with matrices, matrices or with display expanders like data path, FX4 or, or matrix, quad to go stuff, um, you know this kind of scaling up. So however, consider now, even the fact that we have using 12 projectors, it doesn't really matter if it's driven by one um, computer or by four or by three. The calibration technology is independent from that. Calibration technology um, uses projectors as they are, and it's a job of meter server of, or of the playback application whether multiple multiple IGs, uh, sorry, multiple image generators, that's our acronym for this, multiple image generators or single one are used. Um, so that's a, a different topic. On on behalf, on the back of me, you see the um, calibration already. So here you see that um, we have loaded already the calibration, we're going to redo it. So this is how the dome looks like without calibration. So Mayomde, you see again, we have pretty pretty small overlaps. In fact, in a dome, the critical part is always the horizon. So to, uh, hardly visible, uh, but I think you got the point and I, yes, yeah, so that's better. So these are the overlaps we have to work with. So this is a small overlap. This is a smaller overlap and they grow as they go up. So um, working with different overlaps, working with um, Difficult overlaps. This, of course, part of uh, of our daily job. So here comes the point: a dome projection is, on the one hand, um, complex because, yeah, it's not flat. It's all kind of of unpredictable overlaps. But on the other hand, it's pretty easy as uh, as soon as you use a camera, because a fish eye camera, like this, a fish eye camera, to a dome surface is the same as using a flat camera on a flat surface. The beauty of a dome is um, that a fish eye makes it as easy as a panoramic projection. And if you don't believe it, so let's get on with it. Um, pretty much it looks like the same. This is our calibration system and um, we go through this um, well, let me just show it to you. Um, so this is our calibration software and it will act in a very same, very same way as we have seen it on a panoramic. We go to calibrate, well, single client. Well, you can see already that it's made for multi-client. And you remember I had to split. Here again, we have to split because effectively the window system thinks that the 12 projectors are in fact one large projector. It's super great system to to squeeze a lot of performance out of a computer, we can say. So what we need to do here is also to split four by three, that makes 12. And working on split displays really unleashes a lot of uh, performance and this makes a system like that very, very easy, very powerful. Um, as you can see, we have flat screen, curved screen dome. So we use a different scan now. And 
here are pretty much more cameras available. This is the camera that we call Full Dome Calibration Kit. A Logitech webcam is also available. It's the one that films me right now. And there's a data path, which means data path vision is a capturing card. It captures DVI or whatever. So that's the way how you can easily attach um, other kind of um, image sources, like a TV cam via HDMI. Or if you have a capturing card capturing SDI, it's easy to, to use SDI cameras. So in fact, as soon as a camera is uh, recognized as a direct show device or as a uh, comes where you are capturing, it can be used for calibration. So this is not a strip, it is a grid. And um, let's say everything that is not a panorama is a grid. Grid is a different way to calculate the stream and uh, calculate the blend and therefore yeah, it's, it's easy to select. So try to have a look behind me because you will see that um, now these projectors bit by bit get addressed. Takes a while. So, and what we see, you remember, is this checkerboard. This checkerboard is there to verify that the camera has been placed properly. And for the moment, let me just show it. Um, there are some aids how to do this. So you have, you probably see this kind of a crosshatch and of a grid. So that helps actually to position the camera. The camera is already pretty nice uh, positioned. So let me show that it, it's really something happening in real time. Um, oh, well, no, 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 let's change it to something different. Sorry, sorry. So, yep. Yeah. So, um, hello, that's not me. The, appearing in that very camera here. And, well, you can see this red outline, it helps to position the camera. In fact, the camera in a dome should be positioned to be exactly in the center. The better the camera is in the center, the better the initial uh, the initial mapping. Initial mapping means um, whatever is um, whatever is um, shown as a horizon fits or does not fit. It's not end of the world if the camera is off axis, but the less you need to do in warping, the better. So um, again, here you can see um, the mask. A masking is is much more advisable here. So here you see. This is a coming from the windows and the um, afternoon light really heavily pounds in, in in the studio. So it will be very hard for the camera system to um, to ignore this kind of light because the camera system doesn't know that it's the sun. So again, we are using this um, tools to draw a mask. So you can see I'm doing that pretty roughly. Outlining what we call region of interest. So, and then with the paint bucket, we mask it. So since this is a different camera, let's have a look at it. This camera has um, different ways to address the color. It's a monochrome camera because monochrome sensors are much more sensitive. Um, the camera is pretty fast, so up to 40 frames can be displayed, which makes the scanning very, very quick. And with 12 projectors, we want to have it quick. There are a lot of features in this camera. You can post-process, pre-process, trigger, flip, whatever. Usually we don't require these features. Sometimes they can be helpful like flipping and we are happy to have it, um, but handling a computer vision camera is a bit of science on its own. So probably there will be a, a webinar about this. Uh, to be honest, it is quite easy to um, just to handle the camera without all the settings. And this is the reason why we bundle it as a calibration kit. In most of the cases, there's no need to dig deeper into the camera settings as we did it right now. So now it's the same procedure, a sequence of scans. So you can see it starts all with a uh, wide image. Now the scan starts and we see already a result. Well, the result is now a bit, um, hmm, a bit fuzzy. That's because we can see due to this backlight and everything, we see quite a noise. Um, 
I'm going to repeat this step back pretty often. And um, therefore, um, let's just scan the first three projectors because one thing happens right now. For you, it's a bit hard to see the scan, isn't it? There's a little bit a glimpse of it. <laughs> By accident, um, the first projector is the one that you don't see right now through this camera. So let me just um, let me just go through the first um, three or four projectors until you see the result, and um, and then we go a bit deeper into the um, yeah into how it works. So that's the next one. Yeah, you can spot it already, don't you? So there's this this white here. This white is the projector. It looks always a bit weird because this is a fish eye view. It looks so flat, and behind me there's the real view, which is absolutely not flat. So here we are. Let's simply check. Oh, wow, the threshold. So yeah, okay. Let's see if it works. So remember, I'm just now going quickly through the first steps simply to give you a better um, view on the on the testing patterns. We have 12 projectors. There's pretty much an opportunity to show how it works. Okay, and then next one. No, wait a moment. Uh, yeah, still fighting with the threshold. This is the beauty of our studio. Um, I mean that uh, literally because usually it's a bit hard to demonstrate if things are getting wrong. And I, I love this here because I can um, easily show how things are hard when, so when things are going not so good and how to compensate this. But again, I, I don't like the fact that you don't see the projection right now in, in the camera behind me. So let's just get along with it. It's even hard for me to see that. Yeah. So, oh, it's doing a hard job with scanning right now. I'm wondering why that is. Let's try that way. So, yeah, now, now we got it. Okay, so what I'm doing right now, well, I'm doing a scan, I'm evaluating the scan as an operator, and I do some changes. And what exactly does this mean? It's, as you have, can, could have seen in the first session with the panoramic um, display, I, I didn't take any thought about nothing. We just hit uh, calibrate and we are done. But now we are in a more complex scenario. We are in a dome and we have... Um, a pretty hard con conditions right now with um, scattering light and everything. So now comes all the features um, of Aviosa technology to, com to, to get along with this. So first of all, um, filtering the usable image from the noise. It's not simply a filter, it's uh, based on key artificial intelligence of AI. So it's not just using a, a plain filter, but tries to distinguish between um, reflection, specular light, and what could be a projection. So if it looks like that, it's already pretty good, uh, despite the fact that the camera image looks much, much worse. So the size of the dots, it's something that we can um, change accordingly. And remember what we said, make the dots so that they are as small as possible and all green. So let me give some tries. Ah, that's already pretty big, uh, pretty not green. That's green enough. So let's go for it. And so in the back, you can see this is how the scanning works. It's much, much faster because we're using a sophisticated Viosa camera calibration kit. And now we see the result. So there's a testing pattern displayed. Let's see that you can see it a bit better. So you can see the testing pattern already. And we have a quite sophisticated analysis what, what happened. So there is the result of the scan. It's visualized by a um, matrix of dots. In fact, these were the pictures. So that's what we actually have been filming. You remember the dots? These are the dots in the camera view. One dot, one dot, one dot, one dot. So if a dot is recognized, it's outlined red with a dot in the center. 
if a dot is not recognized, like here, it's blue or not recognized at all, and it gives it gives a, a missing. It's it's a hole. So um, the whole game it is is from the dots that we have recognized and missing one to construct a so-called map, a display map, where each projector pixel is represented by a value. And um, that's a quite um, heavy task. That is a lot of math, a lot of heuristics and techniques from artificial intelligence, because what looks easy for us as humans is a quite complex job for computers. So we will have a look at these kind of images um, more often. So right now, everything works right. The map looks more or less like the projector looks like. It's We call it populated, so it's fully filled. I will use one of the next scans to show what happens if this is not the case. So let's go to another projector. So you see it now uh, right over my shoulder. Let's um, calibrate this one. Well, as you can see, this is a projector where the direct sunlight is not hitting it. So it's uh, even easier to calibrate. Um, let's go through it. It's a projector four, still uh, eight more to go. So, and there we go. We see now the next projector uh, here. So this is the result of this projector. You can see that the map and the, so the data set is populated. Uh, we have even, if you, for, for the guys who really like numbers, there's a visualization, visual, visualization <laughs> um, of the coordinates of each dot. It's, it's more like for, for developers. And Again, here's our map. So this is what has been calibrated. This looks good. Um, uh, come on, I closed it by accident. So let's continue. I will pick one of the next projectors and make it bad by purpose, just to give you a little bit of a, of a learning. Um, so this one is good. This one is, yeah, looks pretty weird. Let's look at the threshold. Yes, let's make it really bad this time. Okay, so imagine if you would calibrate like this. Now it's really, really bad now. Um, how much can we compensate that? Well, it's not out of the world. It's easier happening than one expects that you have bad calibration conditions or that you don't have a perfect surface, especially in domes. We have a lot of mobile domes that use um, all kind of weird crooked surfaces. And so therefore it easily happens that you can't film everything properly. So it now tries to do something, really tries. Oh yes, that's that looking marvelous. So have a look at it. Um, it's completely broken. I will show you with a different testing pattern that makes it a bit more obvious to you. So look at it. it this should be a kind of a spider net but what we see is that it is crooked everywhere. So crooked um, scan results, it's a thing that happens very easily and very often. And it's important that you know how to compensate because that differs from a, a lab tool that works only in showrooms from a really live tool that has to stand the biggest domes and the most roughest conditions. By the way, that's what, what Rio stands for. So first of all, let's look how that looks like. So this is, um, what our scanning has received. Well, there's so many pictures. Let me pick the right one for you, this one. So by making it really a bad scan, you can see that these kind of, we call um, um, dot matrix is not complete. It's uh, consisting of many false information. So the map, where's the map? Where's the map? Give me the map. Where is the map? Here's the map, should be the map. Ah, if I don't find it, I'll use this one. Ah, okay, well, the map is completely broken. There is simply no map. So let's find out if we can fix this. So here, as you can see, show info is an inspector. And uh, if you ever try with a calibration, simply have a look at it. Try what you see and you see can see already a lot of noise is there. Um, so if you see a lot of noise, you should eliminate that noise first. Um, 
what you also see is the extrapolation. So um, if we start to work on the extrapolation, we see that something is happening. Okay, so if we now reduce the projection, you can see it in, uh, in the back on what is measured or not what math tries to reconstruct, you can bit by bit work on that and make it better and better looking. So what does that look like? This is now extra, no extrapolation. This is now extrapolation by one dot. It takes a lot to calculate. Well, my, my result is really very, 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 very bad. Ah, uh, tries to extrapolate and extrapolate. Okay, this is a really gross example here. Um, I think I'm going to do a rescan because it was deliberately made wrong and show the effect of the extrapolation in a little bit simpler way where we don't have to wait so long for the extrapolation to calculate. Well, this is what I wanted to show. If something is weird, have a look at the scan. And it's quite obvious what went wrong. It went wrong that there's a lot of noise. So redoing the calculation is easy. We go back, we eliminate the reason for the failure, which is we adjust our noise level. And suddenly we go back to a good and more better looking result. So I think time slips fast and I hope you're not getting too much bored. So with, um, well, I don't see also someone asking in chat. I'm going to speed it up a little bit because what is uh, definitely interesting for you is, well, how to use that in a media server. Um, we can spend hours talking about um, how to handle extrapolation and how to handle um, yeah, each aspect of camera and stuff. So at this moment, let me say that there's a very exhaustive source of documentation and help available. Also, we are constantly working to improve um, the library of tutorial videos. This screencast will also be part of this tutorial. And uh, while this is going to be calculated, I'm showing where you can find that. So let's go to um, where you can see everything. So first of all, oh, I forgot to mention um, everything that you can see here you can evaluate by yourself simply using um, our website vioso.com and here navigate to the downloads and what you've seen at the very beginning operating on the Vioso player this is the easiest way to get started so downloading the player using two projectors on an arbitrary windows pc with an arbitrary graphics card and a webcam if in doubt use the internal one of a laptop um, that will do the job so the Vioso help desk in helpdesk.vioso.com, helpdesk.vioso.com, this is where I said, here's a lot of information and um, also a lot of um, variable information, how to make things good looking and how to handle, um, handle the scan. I'm not covering right now too much of it um, simply because of the time. Just to give you an idea, this is a screencast, but it's just the starting of it. So um, we are at the projector number eight. So as you can see, it gets more and more visible to you. Um, so, and um, it's maybe also obvious how much each projector looks different. Some have noise, some have not. That's exactly live conditions right now. It's not a lab, it's a studio. It comes with, with lights and everything that could make um, life more complicated, but in fact, it's not. So, and once you know where to put your fingers on that, the, in this case, the threshold is the key, it's getting pretty easy. And well, at some point with 12 projector, honestly, it's getting, getting a bit boring. So there we go. And there we go. Projector number nine. You can see that here on the top. So let's have a little bit more details on the dome. So right now you can see very well how the dome looks like. Well, this is the testing pattern that they have been used to. It's a top projector, which is always the most interesting one. So let's see. Oh, you can see there, there was quite a lot of missed dots because obviously the light that scatters into the dome is really making the scanner a hard time. 
So forgive me that I'm now still pushing it um, to show you the results of the extrapolation because extrapolation is the key. And extrapolation is something where our developers worked very hard on it. So in fact, this is what happened. Uh, a bit hard to see here. We are on 2.2, two, yes. So this is what happened. This is the scan. You see all the blue dots, they are the ones that are not recognized. So, and now the missing parts are extrapolated. They are not there. I will choose a different testing pattern. So that makes it a bit more visible to you right now because it's better populated. If you would not be able to extrapolate, it would look like this. You see a lot of dots are missing. And bit by bit, we can close these gaps. Well, just one gap was one is sufficient. Oh, that's surprising. It just takes one step to extrapolate. Well, okay, that's a quite um, low, we call it extrapolation distance, but it fills it, not just to make it even and good looking, but also will fit to the other projectors. So having a proper extrapolation and the proper not only to extrapolate, but also to keep the other projectors in mind. This is the key for the most complex topologies. Not only domes, curved screens, panadomes, curtains, rock faces, you name it. It's projector 10 and counting. and projector 11 and counting. So as you could see, I watch uh, look on the clock shows that uh, one hour is already open uh, done. I hope you're still with me and I promise I will do it um, fast from now on. Just wondering what happened here, was something missing? Was it? Hmm. Try again. So to go to the last um, chapter, which is have a look at how Pixera is working. Pixera, one of the most fascinating media servers that pop up in the in this time. Um, I think here we need a, let's make it tolerant. Let's do it a little bit nicer. Looks a bit weird, the result. Wow. Okay. Let's do it. I think something happened in the scan cause still too much withhold. Well, I can just say, whenever you make a calibration at the dawn, when the sun changes every second, it's quite a challenge. It's what you see right now. And it's, well, it's how it is at this time of a day in Germany, um, at least in Western Germany, the sun, sun goes down our window here. And I would uh, recommend next time we do such a session, I, I'm going to, um, I'm simply going to take more care about the window shades. So on the other hand, it's nice to see what happens because I can show you how to compensate that. Well, let's make it a bit larger. Yes, these are the dots, how I like them. Still refusing. Still refusing, what happens? Come on, come on, don't let me down. Uh, maybe a bit too rough. The thing about the dots is um, the dots should be, if they're too rough, we don't have not so many, not so much information. So not so much measured information. So it's always a bit a balance between a lot of dots, but let's keep, keep them green. And also I'm a bit afraid that the streaming takes a toll because streaming influences the way we read the camera, but that's just a side aspect. So weird things are happening as if the camera is broken, but I don't think so. So still the threshold is firing at me. I would say that is good. Come on. It's always the um, it's always the last step where a projector gets tricky. 
Okay, whatever. Yeah, let's keep it that way. And let's continue to the last ones. Make it a bit brighter, maybe. So here's the threshold. And go on. So while we are scanning, um, we get some questions. Um, that's quite good because we can use the time for the scan to answer the questions. So Marty, um, uh, you can, of course, scale. Um, the question is if we can make uh, this kind of a setup using several servers, let's say three servers, each four outputs, absolutely standard because most servers have uh, um, four outputs. That's what I wanted to say in the very beginning. It is scalable. It doesn't matter how many servers you use, not even how many projectors you're using. From the software, it is scalable to any account and the servers, they are networked. So our calibration already works on a networked environment and is scalable to, well, I think 189, Sergey, 189 was your biggest setup. Yeah, so, um, Yes, it is adaptable to whatever server topology you are using. So finally, we are done. Um, what you see right now is the result of the scan in my back. We have um, we have the mapping. It was a bit turned in the beginning. I just made that for demonstration purposes. And now comes a very interesting point. Um, in fact, to map it, all we need is four dots. It's the same as you would do in a panoramic setup. So in a panoramic setup, we are moving the corners. In a dome setup, we are moving the edges. But in fact, the mapping is simply as it is. And if you remember what I said, the more you center the camera, the less you have to do right now. So my camera was a little bit off axis because I was playing with it. So let me redo that and give me just a few on it. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, camera doesn't show it to you, but for me, it's obvious. So this is the way I would like to have it. So it's now for you a bit hard to see, but the result is simply perfect. There's no double line nowhere. And despite the fact that I was talking all the time, maybe doing things wrong because I was distracted, I don't know, it's simply there, it's done. And we also have an analysis, as you can see, a quite a complex setup. And well, the effective resolution of this dome is now 3,299, so 3,300 3, roughly by 3,200. So it's a little bit offset, but it makes it more or less a one by one, which is exactly what we expect from a dome. So as you can see as well, we didn't take any consideration about the um, blending. The blending simply happened and it happened fast. So in the background, you see, you see now the result. Let me just show you that it's still a um, yeah, calculated result. So we go and um, start a what we now call display compound 277. If you remember, this is an artificial display which no, does nothing but represent this calibration. Um, we load all kinds of um, testing patterns to visualize that. So it's a cube map testing pattern. This is a, a, the grid, the spider net, which is most often used. Um, it, it really depends what you're going to going to display. But let's go to the cube map testing pattern because it's so easy to show. That's without the blend, and that's the blend. So have a closer look. That's without the blend, and that's the blend. So all weird surf um, overlaps you're finding here. And if you go in the blending parameters, you can really see how they are influencing the way the blend is done. And this is really something very complex. So uh, if you would not be um, satisfied with the blend, these are the parameters that we can change. As you can see, the, the initial 
planning parameters, they're really, really good, but we are all used to highest uh, quality. And it, it is required in a planetarium or in a studio situation or in a visualization situation that you need to tweak it. All color, all color um, channels are available. And again, the individual projector adjustment is also there. So, um, yeah, this is what I've been showing, this settings that you might remember from our first session. So as I said, I'm going to, to push it a little bit um, because what is now left is, okay, there's a calibration, but what to do with it? What's, what's the reason for it? Um, we need to play it back in a media server of our choice. So today I prepare to play it back with Pixera. Um, so in fact, the calibration solution knows a lot of so-called export formats. And every application that pops up in the wild has a different way of reading data. So this is a never ending um, job to provide export formats to whatever um, system pops up. So just give an example, we have export for um, Wings, for AV Storm for Wings, AV Storm for Pixera, Kulux, Pandora's Box, Seven Cents, Screen Hippo, uh, Touch Designer, AVO Lite, um, some lesser known media servers, and this is just the media servers. We're not talking about simulation applications, desktop embedding into N NVIDIA. So it's, it's a really, really big topic and keeps the development very busy to, to adapt, but exactly that's our business. So right now, I'm going to export this result is so-called VWF because that's the result, uh, that's the um, uh, format that AV Stumpfel Pixera is reading. There's already a export format predefined. This comes from the settings that also Pixera expects from us. Again, here already pretty much um, many formats and every format can have sub formats. It's a <laughs> quite a quite a science. So. Exporting is nothing else but transforming this raw data into a different way, a different data format. Um, as you can see, this will take a little bit of time um, since there's quite a lot of data to process. And now a file has been created. This file will be required in Pixera when we use camera-based alignment. So at a certain point, this file is required. Um, so it's quite good to memorize where this file has been stored. So again, it's C program data, AV Storm for Wings X. Yes, it's still a Wings folder. It's not Pixera folder, it's the way it is. Um, so I know this, this file path, but this is something that um, every application makes different. So now we are heading to Pixera. Um, on the system, we have Pixera 1.4. It's the current stable version. The user calibration is integrated in Pixera from the very, very first version. We were, have been with Pixera once it was born, which we are quite happy. And it's very exciting to see how far this tool has uh, matured so far. Um, to shortcut it a little bit, um, there's already, uh, there's already um, a predefined show so for people who are not so much appearing with Pixera, Pixera is a 3D based media server. So we are able to model the whole projection scenario in 3D. In fact, that's a generic um, dome, for, um, the dome model. We created that in, in SketchUp simply and imported it here. And this simulation of projectors, it's just for the records. In fact, it looks like an ideal projector setup. And Mayumda, to keep your, um, to get to your question, you can do projectors in an ideal way, but you don't have to. In fact, what we see here in Wings is going to be overwritten by the calibration. So um, the calibration is simply specific on what we get, we use. The better projectors are set up, of course, the less distortion, the better it is. But if let's say there are stages in a way or star projectors in the center, um, then um, we can adapt to it. Um, so that's our Pixera project with the dome in the center. We have here a pre-visualization of it. So 
you can remember it looks pretty much what we did, but it, again, it's a pre-visualization. So there's one thing you need really to know when you're working with Wings, uh, Pixera. Um, the features to use um, camera-based application, there are a screen feature. If you are in the mapping tab, where you access the projectors or the screen, make sure that you change to the screen mode. It's here in the top right corner. Now you can select the screen. Well, sometimes it takes a while until you get it. Select the screen. Now the screen is selected. And here, the screen dome has now a caption Vioso. And this is where you can load the Vioso calibration. So um, loading opens a dialog where we have the available screen. It's just one dome screen. People who are familiar with uh, Pixera know how many, that you can have many screens, that you can model a whole booth or um, showroom. Um, we have the output, which resembles the, um, the screen. And here, this is a bit hard to see. This is a button. You need to click on that gray thing to open a dialog. And well, uh, what did we say? We are in, no, we are in pro C program data. It was done for Wing 6 by Yozo. This is where we have stream test. This is the file we just did. Stream test. Why stream test? Ah, because we are streaming. And yesterday we tested it. So hmm. today it should be called stream final. Um, so we can see it already um, being applied. Why is it applied, by the way? It's from yesterday. Oh, so we, we don't have the before after. Oh, that's that's that's. That's not good. The, the drama is not there. Ah, oh, come on. Let's just let me do something. <laughs> OK, so have a look at it. Um, well, that's how it's supposed to look like. It should be not blended and not warped because, <laughs> well, the whole exercise is to load the calibration and make it um, yeah, make it applied. Well, it's right now it's fine because um, Pixera should act that way. It should memorize the calibration. <laughs> it's just, yeah, the missing drama. So where's the calibration, by the way? Uh, uh, no, I clicked something wrong. No, it's not launch calibration. It's um, clear uh, load at. Here, here we go. Okay. And load warp file. Does it work? Yes, it does. So that's the effect. Now I have it. Um, actually, right now, Pixera is executing the calibration. And from now on, Pixera is handled exactly the way as you use it. So there's the compositing tab. You see here now the, um, the, the screen as we know it. And I put some testing patterns here, which you now can see executed uh, in the back of mine, still perfect in sync, perfect aligned. and starting a video, let Pixera playback. Highest resolution, no master content. So it's in fact as easy as that. The calibration takes away all the pain to align the projectors manually. It takes away the pain to think about the blend. All you do need to concentrate is that you have a proper camera setup, that you know a little bit about um, how to operate it, let it done this difficult job and then concentrate on Pixera and content and backdrop and whatever. So knowing that I'm really nearly 20 minutes over the time I proposed, um, this is the result I wanted to show you today. I starting easy with a panorama and I, I really can encourage you to try that at home. And um, finishing showing you a complex calibration and import that into Pixera.